This is Rockingham Bay near Tamashanta Point. I've come here halfway up the coast of Queensland to follow an explorer I've always admired. I'm sitting out on an expedition right to the tip of Cape York. When I was a kid at school learning about this, I never dreamed that one day I'd actually come here. Our schoolhouse was named after the expedition leader. His name was Edmund Kennedy, and he was just 29 years old when he left the Tamashanta here in May 1848. All up, there were 13 in the party, including Jackie Jackie, an incredibly resourceful Aboriginal tracker from the Hunter Valley down in New South Wales. There was also a botanist called William Caron. A lot of what I've found out about the expedition comes from the journal that he kept along the way. How Kennedy became a national hero and why 10 blokes died is what I want to find out by following their route. This expedition became one of the biggest disasters in Australian exploration history. But why? From the minute he got here, Kennedy realised that he had a real problem. You see, back in that era, the map makers had told him that this country here was all flat and lightly wooden and all the rest. Of course it's not. He wrote in his journal that a more vile country had never stared him in the face before. Well, I don't think it's real vile. In fact, a whole bunch of Australians come up here for holidays. But you've got to remember what Kennedy was trying to do. Imagine walking two drays and a hundred sheep through this sort of country. No wonder he was absolutely staggered by it. Well, if you thought this was crook, it was worse to come. This is roundabout where I reckon he landed. And it was from here that all his problems started. For the first few weeks, Kennedy travelled up and down along the coastline. He just trying to find a way inland. Imagine trying to get through this stuff with 28 horses, 100 sheep, four dogs and a bunch of carts. Ridiculous gear for this sort of country. In this part of the world, coastal rainforest and mangrove often forms a barrier to anyone trying to get through. Eventually they found a way inland, here at Nyunga Creek. The idea was to make their way up the east coast of Cape York and get resupplied with a ship along the way and then turn around and come back down along the west coast. Back in those days, rainforests like this stretched for hundreds of kilometres along this part of the coastline. Dragging carts through this sort of stuff would have been a real pain for him. Nowadays, of course, much of it has been cleared to make way for pastoral land, which was one of the main reasons why the authorities were so keen on the Kennedy expedition. They wanted to know just how viable the area was from an agricultural point of view. As far as we can judge, this is about the spot where Kennedy dumped his carts. He stood here and he had to look over that way then. Of course, back in those days, it wasn't clear like it is today. It was all scrub country. He's actually about only 20 kilometres inland and it's taken him 10, 11 days to get here. Why? Because he had to cut a road all the way to get those carts through that scrub country. Well, finally the penny dropped. Get rid of the carts, he reckoned. And that's where he dumped them, down that creek there. But when he stood on this knoll here, took his compass bearing up the Tully River Gorge there, you can see behind me, and had a look at the mountains and said, there's no way in the world I'm going to get them up there. Just take a look at them. Even today, this country is extremely difficult to get through, but Kennedy and his men refused to be beaten by it. 
This is how Karen described it in his journal at the time. During these three days, we travelled over an irregular mountainous country, intersected by numerous creeks running in every direction, but all of them with belts of scrub on each side. We sometimes crossed the same creeks two or three times a day, owing to the tortuous directions they took, and our clothes were kept wet all day. Some of the rivers too had very steep banks, which presented other obstacles to the progress of our horses. Between the creeks, small patches of open forest land intervened, with large blocks of rock scattered over them. Most of the creeks had a rocky bottom and were running to the eastward. But eventually they broke out to more open country. They were coming into contact with the local Aboriginals all the time. Mostly there were no problems, but on at least one occasion, the expedition opened fire on a hostile group and at least one Aboriginal was killed. Now it's possible that this news spread rapidly ahead of them and may well have had a bearing on what happened to Kennedy later on. As the expedition moved through this country, the Aboriginal people who lived here were obviously keeping a pretty close eye on them. On this rock wall behind me, you can see this rock art and it's a horse. Here we've got the neck, a pair of ears going up here, the head, and even a pair of reins racing off into the air there. So somewhere along the line, they've seen horses moving through this country. Now whether this horse was one of Kennedy's, I don't know. But obviously impressed the local Aboriginal people. I don't know, somehow the idea that this horse was one of Kennedy's, it's got some appeal to me. Perhaps it is. Now it's been suggested that some of the men were on pretty intimate terms with the local women without Kennedy knowing about it. Which is not a real good way to go travelling around the countryside. This trip is still one of the great four-wheel drive adventures in Australia. The track I'm on now is roughly about halfway up Cape York Peninsula. By the time Kennedy reached here, the whole expedition were reduced to eating their horses just to stay alive. With almost no food, the men and the animals were getting sicker by the day from malnutrition and diarrhoea and of course malaria. These things here are those nonda plums. I only grow in Cape York these things and they fall to the ground when they're ripe like this. These little fruit have a real role to play in the Kennedy expedition. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be telling this story here today. I'll tell you down the track about that. Kennedy was desperate to get to this spot in Princess Charlotte Bay so that he could meet up with a resupply ship called the Bramble. But he couldn't make it because the rivers and the creeks and the mudflats, they all stopped him getting through to the coast. If old Kennedy could see what happened here today, he'd turn in his grave. It took him four months of struggle to get here. I've done the same trip in that motor car in four days. Well, he had no Bramble, no resupply, nowhere to go except north and that's what he did up that way Weymouth Bay was to be a turning point for the whole expedition
Of course, Kennedy was a POM, and you can see it coming through in the way he did things. For instance, he insisted that every Sunday should be treated as a day of rest, with prayers, even though they were so far behind in their schedule. By the time they got here, Kennedy realised they were in deep trouble. They killed all their sheep, the men were on their last legs, and they only had nine horses left. This location is extremely important from the Kennedy Expedition point of view because this is the spot here where he put Camp 80, LXXX. That's how he used to write his camp numbers on the tree in Roman numerals. It's a very remote part of Australia. There's no roads around here and to get here you either hoof it on foot for miles and miles or get a helicopter like that. I know this is the right spot because firstly they give us a latitude and secondly they tell us something about the creek line. Come and have a look at this. One of Australia's biggest exploration tragedies happened right here. This little sandy bar here is exactly the way Karen describes it. He reckons it separates the brackish water from the fresh and that's what happens. But it's got more significance than just that because it's here that Kennedy and the four others crossed this creek and headed north. And they left behind eight blokes under Karen. Six of them ended up dying. We lost six Australian explorers right here. When you look around here, it appears terrific. But these blokes just didn't understand the bush. I'll give you some idea of just how crooked things were for these blokes in this camp here of Karen's. One morning, Karen came down to this creek here, and he found one of his blokes sitting on the bank, feet in the water, dead. He'd obviously staggered down during the night and sat down and just died. Meanwhile, Kennedy and the Aboriginal tracker Jackie Jackie, along with three others, took off for Cape York. The plan they had was to get the resupply ship to pick up Karen and his mob on the way back. Really got to take your chances when they present themselves in this country. Well, Kennedy wasn't getting too many breaks though. Left half his mob back there in Weymouth Bay. If you thought that was bad, there's a lot worse to come yet. This spot I'm heading for now means a lot to me. It's the site of Kennedy's Camp 84. And I once led an army expedition here. That was over 20 years ago. How far would you say down to the camp? Well, we can now put this hill on the map, which it wasn't before. He used to be a young fellow then. Interest in Australian history 
Okay. Been with me a long time. Yeah. He's got this hill marked there on his sketch. Yeah, mm. it's too far south. In front, he's got two, three creeks. One, two, three. Yeah. Up until that trip, no one had found Camp 84. Something that I was determined to do, because it marks a turning point in the whole Kennedy expedition. So he sent Jackie up here, probably, you know, somewhere where we're standing along this edge here now. To look By the time they got here, only Kennedy and Jackie were fit enough to keep going. It certainly feels a little bit weird climbing the same hill after all those years. Way out there we got Shelburne Bay. I'm about eight miles inland here on top of a great flat hill. About 600 foot up and it's pretty blowy today, I can tell you. On the maps these days, this hill doesn't have a name. I reckon it should be called Jackie's Puddin' Pan Hill because he climbed up here. Kennedy said, get up that hill there, have a look around the countryside, and that way we'll know where to send the rescue boat back to pick up the fellows at Camp 84. Camp 84 was about one mile back that way. And what happened there was that the three other men that were with Kennedy, Costigan, Dunn and Luff, were left behind because Costigan had an accident with a rifle and shot himself through here. So they left them there. Those three blokes were never heard of again. Meanwhile, Kennedy and Jackie Jackie, in a real bit of desperation, take off to the north, trying to get to the aerial, the rescue ship. Of the original 13 that set out together, there were now only Kennedy and Jackie still on the go. The two men were now almost totally dependent on each other. At one stage, Jackie fell into a bog and Kennedy helped him out. And later on, Kennedy was crooked and so Jackie carried him for over two miles. driving up here just before the wet, you're gonna come across fires like this. And they look very destructive, especially when they take out fully grown trees, but they're invaluable in keeping the bush healthy. This tree here could do someone a real damage, especially at night time. the trailer off back up the way there. Might be just as well I did too. This sort of thing here, burning off of the country, happens every year up here in Northern Australia. It's been going on for years and years, since day one. It's all part of the seasonal cycle. Get rid of all the ground cover, the litter and the grass and the dead leaves and everything, clear it all out just before the wet season comes. Rain comes along, dumps down, and suddenly all the grass jumps up all fresh and new and the whole cycle begins over and over again. Get rid of this log.
Kennedy and Jackie finally got here to the mouth of the Escape River. They could just see the ship anchored up there near Albany Island, but they still had to get around the river to reach it, so they started to go upstream to look for a crossing point. Kennedy and Jackie had gone about half a mile when they came into contact with one of the fiercest local tribes who tracked them for the next day and a half. What the two of them had no way of knowing was that this mob were about to turn hostile. Jackie Jackie only survived by firing his gun at the attackers. As far as I can figure it, this is about the spot here where Kennedy and Jackie got attacked by the local Aboriginals. They've been following them up for some time and they're very concerned about it. And then finally, late in the afternoon, the attack happened and Kennedy, he was speared almost straight away. The reason why I think this is the spot is because Jackie gives us an excellent description. Not only that, but he comes back 12 months later with another group of people and brings them in here and says, this is where Mr. Kennedy got killed. And they've written all the details down. Apparently, there were three of these anthills here in those days. And in this whole plain today, there's only one. For the next 10 days, Jackie Jackie struggled to get to the aerial. He often had to wade up to his neck in crocodile infested water to try and avoid getting caught. I tell you what, there's no way you'd get me in that water around here, except in my tinny. Lost the bung out of me boat down the track there a bit, so carved up a replacement out of a bit of bushwood here. See if it works in a minute. I guess you really got to ask yourself the question, what did Jackie live off for those 10 days when he's trying to get through to Cape York? Obviously he couldn't use his gun, after all he's trying to keep a low profile and he doesn't want to draw attention to himself, so what did he eat? Well he tells us. You remember way back down the Cape there, I showed you that nonda plum. This thing here, well it grows up here as well. That's what he survived off, nonda plum, for the 10 days. Just wonder how we'd get on if we didn't have that up here. How Jackie would get on. Anyway, see if this works. Left on his own, Jackie must have been absolutely terrified. So you've got to remember he didn't come from around here. He came from New South Wales, so this was not his country. Jackie Jackie kept on going until finally in December, 1848, he staggered out at the rendezvous point and he made contact with the aerial. He was the only man from the expedition to actually make it to the top. Of the original party of 13, only three survived. Jackie Jackie, the botanist William Caron, and a bloke called Goddard. And what of Jackie Jackie? He was hailed as a national hero, and rightly so. He'd done all he could to help them survive, and defended Kennedy to the very end. To my mind, he's one of the great figures in exploration in Australia. <laughs> 